Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many of you at this evening's Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia series. My name is Monica Trent, and I am the college-wide dean for the English Language for Academic Purposes program, Linguistics and Communication Studies, and I'm the Germantown Humanities Dean who oversees the Athenaeum Symposia. First, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Tiffany Banks, who's in the audience for being our faculty coordinator for this series this year, and she has invited Mr. Craig Shirley to sit and speak with us tonight, along with one of our faculty colleagues, uh, Professor Jennifer Haydell. So this should be a really special evening. For students who are sitting in the audience, we would love it if you all stayed until the end and took an opportunity to speak to Mr. Shirley with the microphones that are on both sides, and that's for our community members as well. So if you have a question, you might want to jot that down as you're listening to the interview and be prepared to pose a question at the end. I also have a few practical notes. If you need a certificate of attendance, they'll be available at the exit once you leave the program. Please also remember to silence your cell phones so that they are not a distraction. We'd also like to invite you to stay after to potentially win one of Mr. Shirley's fantastic books which he will be signing at the end of this evening's lecture. While I'm very excited to hear Craig Shirley speak about Ronald Reagan and the New Republican Party, my own background is in English, so I thought it would be wise to invite one of our history and political science faculty to help with this event. We also have her department chair as well, who's going to provide a little assistance. Mr. Shirley will be interviewed this evening by Jennifer Haydell, who is the Associate Professor of Political Science here on the Germantown campus at Montgomery College. Before she begins, I would like to invite Dr. Joe Thompson to introduce Professor Haydell and give you a couple of pieces of information. I, I understand tonight we are live on Facebook. We're streaming live on Facebook, so hi, Mom. <laughs> My mom is an 85-year-old devotee of Facebook. Donald Trump once bragged that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue in broad daylight and would not lose a single supporter. This might be true. His supporters are loyal to a fault. However, I believe that even the most loyal Trump supporter would turn against the president and vote for Chelsea Clinton if he would say one bad word about Ronald Reagan. Reagan has become a saint-like figure to the modern Republicans, a conservative icon. He is, in their view, the greatest American of the 20th century, a man whose face belongs on route, uh, route, Mount Rushmore alongside other giants. Looking around the room, I see that most of you don't remember Ronald Reagan, the man. <laughs> I do. Um, it may come as a surprise to you that he was not always so revered. There was a time that even Republicans looked askance at this actor uh, and doubted whether or not he would be a great leader. To Democrats, hi, Mom, <laughs> Reagan was a joke. He was too old to be president. He was too conservative. He was forgetful. He would launch the Third World War. He was a TV pitch man, a B-movie actor most famous for playing straight man to a chimpanzee in Bedtime for Bonzo. That's true. He actually played alongside a monkey. And yet even Democrats today acknowledge President Reagan's virtues and accomplishments. Many of them are nostalgic for Mr. Reagan in this, the age of Mr. Trump. So how did we get there? How did we go from Bedtime for Bonzo to Mount Rushmore? To find these answers, we must turn to historians. That's our job. We must turn to those who dedicate their lives to uncovering the truth about the past, to demonstrating that while he may not have been the saint that Republicans revere, he certainly wasn't the incompetent boob that Democrats always underestimated. Our guest tonight, Mr. Craig Shirley, is one of those historians. 
Mr. Shirley is the author of several well-received and well-regarded books, including four that cover the life and legacy of our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. His most recent, Reagan Rising, published last year and available for sale in the lobby, uh, uh, covers the wilderness years, what I would call Reagan's wilderness years. The four years between Reagan's failed attempt to secure the Republican nomination in 1976 and his successful, uh, his triumph at the Republican convention. Like all good historians, Mr. Shirley does, has done the world a great service. His books are well researched. He, they are well written and chock full of detail. I am a political junkie and he is my pusher. Thank you, sir. <laughs> he has waded deep into the weeds to uncover the truth about Ronald Reagan, a very complex man who led our nation during a very tumultuous time. Whether or not Mr. Reagan belongs on Mount Rushmore is still a matter of debate. Whether or not Mr. Shirley belongs on a very short list of great Reagan biographers is not up for debate. He does belong on that list, and tonight he belongs to us. Jennifer, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, to start with, I was... I don't know if I can top that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's always hard to follow, <laughs> Professor Thompson. Um, I wonder if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be a Reagan biographer. Uh, I was... Uh, Beginning of uh, the, the Charles Dickens book, I am born, right? Um, Charles Di from, uh, what was it, uh, David Copperfield, I am born. Uh, I was born in Syracuse in 1956. My father was a uh, city firefighter. My mother was a homemaker. Uh, they were always politically involved. Um, at our dinner table every night uh, was not for the faint of heart because we got together every night and we talked about politics the environment, the Vietnam War, race relations, uh, war, peace, conflict. It was my brother, my sister, myself, and my mother, my father, and they pushed us and pushed us and made us think, and, and really the Socratic method of inquiry, ask questions, get answers, ask questions, they were doing the Socratic method of reasoning with, with us as children. So we were always naturally uh, curious about things, especially American history. I, my, my father, uh, when he married my mother, uh, their, for their honeymoon, they went on a tour of uh, American Revolutionary and Civil War uh, uh, monuments and museums through uh, Virginia and through uh, Washington, D.C. They went to Mount Vernon and Valley, you know, down, down Valley Forge in Pennsylvania and Bull Run and things like that. So I was always very immersed in American history. So as a consequence, I was a, when I went to college, I was a history and political science major. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I got into national politics, worked, my wife Serene, who's here tonight, we both worked uh, for Reagan, uh, the White House Conference on Small Business. We worked in politics. We, we, we met on the 80 campaign, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, and uh, so we were just always involved in national politics. Uh, and I opened a, uh, Back in 84, after Reagan won his re-election, I opened my own public relations firm. And part of that firm, part of the responsibility was to do writing for other people. I would write you know, op-eds and letters and speeches and things like that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, somebody once asked me, they said, they said what is the most profitable form of writing? Is it, is it, is it writing op-eds, it was writing speeches, is it writing testimony, is it writing books, and I thought for a minute, I said, the most profitable form of writing is ransom notes. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, in the course of my business, which still operates, uh, is that we, uh, we had a, a, a publishing house. Uh, there was a client of my firm, and there was a standing order that if we've ever had a good idea for a book, we were supposed to tell the publisher about it. Uh, and so one day I, I told the publisher, I said, you know, I, I got a great idea for a book. He said, okay, what's that? I said, you know, nobody's ever done a book about the 1976 Reagan campaign uh, where he narrowly lost to Gerald Ford. This is the closest primary uh, since uh, Taft and, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt in 1912, where Taft narrowed beat uh, Roosevelt the no for the nomination. 
even though Teddy Roosevelt won all 12 Republican primaries that year, Taft was the incumbent president. He controlled the levers of power at the National Convention. Uh, so he was renominated, which of course sent Teddy off to run his third party Bull Moose ticket, which cost Taft re-election. Uh, but Reagan, uh, challenging Gerald Ford, only lost by 87 delegate votes out of 2,287 cast in Kansas City. And he always said, Mrs. Reagan always said it was the most exciting of all of his campaigns for governor, for president, it was always the most exciting. He always thought it was the most exciting, and from the standpoint of history, it's probably the most interesting because it changes history for, uh, in dramatically different ways. And so, anyway, the publisher said, I love the idea. Who do you suggest write it? And I said, I don't know, let me check. So over the course of the next two or three weeks, uh, I checked with various columnists and political science professors and reporters, and nobody could, nobody was either interested or had the time to write the book. I report this back to the publisher, and he says, you know, a few little words would change the course of my life. He says, well, why don't you write it? So uh, I said, uh, uh, sure. <laughs> I said, what do I do? He says, write a treatment. I said, what's a treatment? <laughs> he, he laughs. He says, I'll send you a couple to use as templates. So he sent me a couple, and I write the treatment, which is basically an explanation of the book, the background, the wow factor, the market, who's going to be interested in this book. Basically, it's a, it's a rationale, four or five page rationale for writing the book and why people will be interested in it. So I sent it off to the publisher, and within a matter of days, I got a FedEx package. And as I like to tell people, this is that there was a contract and a very large advance. And as I like to tell people, it says, the good news is I got a contract in a very large advance. The bad news is I got a contract in a very large advance. You know, which means, of course, I got to write the book. So anyway, that, that kind of, that was, that was the first book. Uh, it got well reviewed. Then I was, another publisher approached me about writing a book on the 80 campaign. I wrote that, that got, you know, reviewed. Um, and then I wrote, uh, actually my third book was a detour from Reagan. Uh, I wrote a book called December 1941, which is a New York Times bestseller, uh, and which is now in Hollywood being uh, gone through by some folks who want to make it into a movie. They saw the success of, uh, uh, of, of Churchill. Um, Oh, yeah, Dunkirk, yes, Dunkirk, and also, um, um, yes, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Trouble hearing. Uh, so now, they said, anyway, this book, December 1941, was about the 31 days of December and how December 7th changed American culture, politics, society, everything radically and forever. Made the New York Times bestsellers list. Then I went back to writing two more books on Reagan. Uh, and also a book on uh, Newt Gingrich, and now I'm working on half a dozen more books. So, very long way of answering a very good short question. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have kind of different levels of background knowledge in the room about Reagan's background, sure. and Dr. Thompson just gave us his rundown. Um, could you share a little bit about what people should know about Reagan's background before 1976? Reagan grew up poor in Illinois. He had a brother. Uh, who's, you know, his uh, relationship with his parents, uh, with Jack and Neil, was that Reagan never called his parents mom and dad. They always called them Jack and Neil, uh, Nell. And they always called the two boys, in turn, by their nicknames, by Moon and Dutch, not by Neil and, uh, and Ronald. Uh, so they had a very, very friendly, close, casual relationship with their parents. Um, is that Reagan, when they were young boys, his mother was in the Disciples of Christ Church, uh, which is Protestant. Jack Reagan, his father, was Roman Catholic, and the boys were given their choice which religion they wanted to go into. Neil, Reagan's older brother, chose to follow his father's footsteps and go into the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, uh, but Reagan chose to go to his mother's uh, Disciples of Christ, uh, and it was a very um, it was not only a spiritual religion, it was a, it was, there was a lot of missionary work. It was not unusual for the Reagans to, for instance, bring prisoners 
who were on furlough, weekend furlough, into the house and stay for the weekend uh, because that was part of our missionary work for the Disciples of Christ. So it was a very, very soft, very understanding, very forgiving form of, uh, of Christianity. But Jack Reagan was Roman Catholic, and he inculcated in the young Reagan what I would call a parish perspective in that Reagan, as he grew up and as he became a politician, he never used, the, he never, rarely used the pronouns I, me, and my. He more often used the pronouns we, us, and ours. He actually spoke like a Democrat. And he got that, I believe, from his father. Uh, and, and, and people noted it as he matured as a, as a political leader that he didn't speak like a Republican. He didn't talk like a, a Protestant Republican. He talked like, uh, he, in fact, if you hear Reagan and you close your eyes, is that you hear John Kennedy. John Kennedy never said, my government, my White House, my cabinet. He would say, your White House, your government, this cabinet. And Reagan was the first Republican politician to, to speak uh, like a, a, in a parish perspective because he got that from his father. It made, made him very, very unique as a politician, which is in one way explains his reach and appeal to uh, Democrats and independents because he, he was not a typical Republican. Great, thank you. Um, this is actually a really good segue into sharing the video. Yeah, sure. If we could actually go ahead and cue the video. I'll have you explain it after. Okay. Is somebody able to turn on the lights so they can see it better? We are all a part of this great Republican family that will give the leadership to the American people to win on November 2nd. I would like I would be honored on your behalf to ask my good friend, Governor Reagan, to say a few words at this time. Mr. President, Mrs. Ford, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President to be. <laughs> the distinguished guest here and you ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say fellow Republicans here, but to those who are watching from a distance, all those millions of Democrats and independents who I know are looking for a cause around which to rally and which I believe we can give them. <laughs> Mr. President, before you arrive tonight, these wonderful people here, when we came in, gave Nancy and myself a welcome. But that, plus this, and plus your kindness and generosity in honoring us by bringing us down here, will give us a memory that will live in our hearts forever. Watching on television these last few nights, and I have seen you also with the warmth that you greeted Nancy, and you also filled my heart with joy when you did that. May I just say some words? There are cynics who say that a party platform is something that no one bothers to read and it doesn't very often amount to much. Whether it is different this time than it has ever been before, I believe the Republican Party has a platform that is a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. just heard a call to arms based on that platform and a call to us to really be successful in communicating 
and reveal to the American people the difference between this platform and the platform of the opposing party, which is nothing but a revamp and a reissue and a running of a late, late show of the thing that we've been hearing from them for the last 40 years. If I could just take a moment and tell, I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now on our tricentennial. It sounded like an easy assignment. They suggested I write something about the problems and issues of the day, and I set out to do so, riding down the coast in an automobile, looking at the blue Pacific out on one side and the Santa Ynez Mountains on the other, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was going to be that beautiful a hundred years from now as it was on that summer day. And then, as I tried to write, let your own minds turn to that task. You're going to write for people a hundred years from now who know all about us. We know nothing about them. We don't know what kind of a world they'll be living in. And suddenly, I thought to myself, if I write of the problems, they'll be the domestic problems of which the president spoke here tonight, the challenges confronting us, the erosion of freedom that has taken place under Democrat rule in this country, the invasion of private rights, the controls and restrictions on the vitality of the great free economy that we enjoy. These are our challenges that we must meet. And then again, there is that challenge of which he spoke, that we live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Will they look back with appreciation and say, thank God, for those people in 1976 who headed off that loss of freedom, who kept us now a hundred years later free, who kept our world from nuclear destruction. And if we failed, they probably won't get to read the letter at all because it spoke of individual freedom and they won't be allowed to talk of that or read of it. This is our challenge. And this is why here in this hall tonight, better than we've ever done before. We've got to quit talking to each other and about each other and go out and communicate to the world that we may be fewer in numbers than we've ever been, but we carry the message they're waiting for. We must go forth from here united, determined that what a great general said a few years ago is true. There is no substitute for victory. Mr. President. say one thing, it's just that politics is the art of the possible because Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan are acting like long lost friends there. They actually hated each other. So actually along those lines, could you talk a little bit about the significance of the speech, yes. the significance of the primary? Yeah, as I mentioned before, this is Kansas City, 1976. Don't judge our fashions too harshly in 1976. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. some of us used to wear polyester that had uh, labels inside that said, you're not do not wear in your open flame, uh, uh, you know, bad lapels, bad sideburns. It was not a, it was not a, uh, a pinnacle of, of good fashion in those days. So you got to be a little bit charitable as far as uh, 1976. Reagan is not supposed to give the speech. He has just lost the nomination of Gerald Ford after through going through 30 uh, convent the state primaries and another 15 uh, state conventions. He just lost the nomination of Gerald Ford by the narrowest of margins. Now, Ford is presiding over a broken party. Half the party wants Gerald Ford, the other half wants Ronald Reagan. 
He's, there are poll, there's polling at the time which has him 30 points behind Jimmy Carter, who had been nominated the month before at a love fest in New York City. Uh, and it looked like Carter was going to go on and just crush Ford and, and sweep out Republicans with large coattails. Ford has to produce a unified convention, so he asks Reagan to give this speech. Reagan does so. No preparation, no teleprompter, no prepared speech. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's up in his skybox, and he has no intention. He does an interview with Tom Brokaw. Now, this is all, remember, this is 1976. NBC, CBS, and ABC dominated the airwaves. There was no internet. There was no Facebook. There was no Snapchat. There was nothing. It was just television, three networks, and, and, uh, and PBS, and local, you know, little local stations. Uh, but millions of people are watching this, and the networks used to broadcast literally gavel to gavel. The convention would open up at noon, and the networks would break in for live coverage, and they might broadcast for, you know, for 12, 14 hours. I remember the 72 uh, George McGovern uh, Democratic Convention where they broadcast for hours on end before, and, and McGovern finally accepted the nomination at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the networks were still broadcasting it. So this is, but millions of people are watching this because they have no choice. There's nothing else on. Reagan is not supposed to give this speech. Ford asked him to give the speech as he's making the way to the podium. You know, and, and there's 17,000 people. He's up in the skybox. 17,000 people. Ford is pleading with him to come to the podium, come to the podium. And then his family is pleading with him. And then 17,000 people are all chanting, we want Ron, we want Ron, we want Reagan. So Reagan reluctantly makes his way to the podium. And he turns to Mike Deaver, and who's a longtime aide, and he says, Mike, what will I say? And Deaver says, the Governor, you'll think of something. He gives this speech, and the response to this speech is immediate, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. He has no intention of running in 1980. Is that everybody said he was 65 years old in 1976. He'd be too old. He'd be 69 in 1980. He'd be too old, the party's passed him by, politics has passed him by. He gives his speech. He's out campaigning in the fall for various Republican candidates running at various offices around the country. Every place he goes, cops, chambermaids, doormen, uh, everybody is pleading with him, Governor, you've got to run one more time. You've just got to run. And this, I believe, convinces him to run one more time in 1980 because of the tremendous outpouring he got as a result of this speech. All right, thank you. Um, to actually quote from the author's note in your book, uh, you wrote, Reagan was a constantly evolving individual. His worldview in 1964 was not his worldview in 1980. His conservatism had changed from being simply against the intrusions of big government to the more positive advance of individual freedom. Could you talk a bit about that transition that you sure. write about? Yeah, Reagan, um, is, uh, as I said earlier, is, is that most men reach a point in their life where they adopt a settled view of the world, somewhere in their 30s or 40s, and that becomes their framework. And that is how they view the world, and that's how they, for, for the rest of their lives. Not so with Reagan. He's constantly evolving, uh, even into his 50s or 60s. Reagan, the conservative Reagan of 1964, is completely unlike. You look at if you go back tonight, look at his speech for Goldwater in 1964, and while it's, it's, it's in, in some regards a brilliant speech, it's also very negative, and he's angry. He's angry at Lyndon Johnson. He's angry at anti-war protesters. He's an angry at the conduct of the Vietnam War. He's an angry at the popular culture. But by 1980, he's completely changed his presentation. He's not anti-liberal, he's pro-conservative, he's not anti-government, he's pro-freedom in, in, in every regard. He's not anti-communism, he's pro-global you know, global freedom, is that, is that his pr presentation changes radically. And he's also read a lot more, too. He's, he very much becomes a child of the Enlightenment without the possessive I pronoun of the Enlightenment. He is a, he's, if it's possible, He's got a Catholic worldview, which is also imbued by his, by his uh, acceptance of the Enlightenment as his cultural and political outlook.
uh, the, the synthesis there uh, between pain and souls and needs and so that he if, he believes that if, if, if man is at the center of the universe which is what the enlightenment teaches then God is there with him is what Solzhenitsyn uh, later alluded to so that it is a God inspired universe it's a God inspired man uh, and so he becomes fully formed by 1980 as what I would call an American conservative who is anti-establishment, pro-individual rights, pro-privacy, pro-dignity, anti-government intrusion. He uh, is that, you know, as I tell people, is, is that um, the time when I didn't sleep through high school physics, um, I remember the teacher saying is, is that, Power can neither be destroyed nor created. It can only be moved around. So what he wants to do is, is that he wants to reverse, since 1930, 1932 and the rise of the New Deal, power has been going to Washington. More and more power, money, regulation, everything else. He wants to reverse this and take it back to where, at least to some regard, where the framers and founders intended, which is more power for the individual, the county, the state, and localities and less power for the national government. Um, and so he, so he, he evolves very much uh, as being just a beginner into being a proponent of, of freedom, privacy, dignity, and the ever expansion uh, of, of human freedom. Great, thank you. Um, leading into that, a lot of your book is really talking about debates in the Republican Party about what the party should stand for, yes. in, in, especially in that 76 to 80 time frame. Right. Um, what role did Reagan's change in worldview play in that? What role did Reagan's campaigns uh, play in that debate? Reagan is the straw that stirs the drink. Uh, Bill Buckley was, by the way, today is the 10th anniversary of Bill Buckley passing. Um, and uh, I, I knew Bill, not well, but I knew him. Uh, but he and Reagan are the two most important, Goldwater to, to, to a lesser extent, are the two most important figures in American conservative, modern American conservative history because of their writing, because of their pronouncement, because of their speeches, because of their action. Um, and Reagan completely changes the Republican Party um, to one, like for instance on the issue of Soviet relations, which is a big issue. Now, one thing about this film is that everybody has to remember and realize is that this was in the depths of the Cold War, it is that it was not unusual for us, you know, my age and people my age to, for US News or Newsweek or Time to do a cover story every couple weeks on some type of potential nuclear showdown between the Soviet Union and the United States. And of course, there were flashpoints all over the world. Obviously, Vietnam, uh, Africa, so, uh, Central America. There were lots of, uh, of Amer pro-freedom West versus communist East battles, Korea in the, in the 50s, uh, between the East and West. I mean, this was, this was the subject of, uh, this is what preoccupied everybody. The space race that John Kennedy launched uh, is the, the Vietnam War, which, which was evolved from Eisenhower through Nixon. That was a, about communism versus uh, Western freedom. It dominates all conversation, all world views, all actions by the United States and by the NATO forces and by the Warsaw Pact forces. So. Uh, is, is that this is, this is the predominant issue which dominates everything from 1945 up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 19, 1990. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things that I was struck by uh, when I was reading the preface to your, to your book is that you, you really place Reagan in a global context. Yes. And so you mention the importance in 1979 of Margaret Thatcher, yes. of Pope John Paul II, right. Mikhail Gorbachev. And when I was reading that, I was thinking about a book that's focused on 1979 called Strange Rebels. And they add in Ayatollah Khomeini right. and Deng Xiaoping. So I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about kind of where you see Reagan fitting in that list that you mentioned in particular. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure Reagan, I think all historians and most students of history give Reagan most of the credit for, for winning the Cold War. 
not ending, but actually winning the Cold War. And even Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, who's the Soviet premier. Now think about this, is that here is a man who's been marinated in communism, collectivism. He's the leader of the most powerful collectivist state in the world. He is the party leader. He's surrounded by people who espouse collectivism. He believes, you know, as, as Khrushchev said, is that, that they would bury the West, is that in every fiber of his being, he's been raised and becomes a Soviet premier, believing the superiority of the collectivist state over the free state. And yet at the end, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, with the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, with the collapse of uh, the Baltics, uh, the, the, uh, and the, then the Soviet Union itself, Gorbachev himself says, the future is clear and it points toward freedom. He is embracing the ideology of his bitter opponents for, for, the, for the 60 some odd years, is that he'd been taught that freedom was wrong, he'd been, his party taught freedom was wrong, he became set head of the Soviet state. So Gorbachev is important, but only because he surrenders his ideology and his philosophy, ultimately his empire, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Reagan's arguments, Reagan's military buildup. Without Reagan, you know, if you go to 1980, before Reagan's elected, we're losing the Cold War, is that Southeast Asia has fallen to communism, Nicaragua has fallen to communism, Afghanistan, the Soviets invaded in 1979, is that in every measurable way, the Soviet Union is winning the Cold War and America is losing the Cold War. Eight years later, Reagan's elected in 1980, eight years later is that that's all reversed. The Soviets are withdrawing from Afghanistan. The Soviets are withdrawing from Nicaragua. Southeast Asia is becoming a bastion of free market uh, principles and, and democratic rule. Is that China is, is, is loosening up its, its marketplace, not its politics, but at least opening up you know, communications and, and marketplaces to, uh, to the West. Is that, and, and eventually the Soviet Union collapses, the Berlin Wall comes down, which had been built to, to keep people in Eastern Europe from fleeing in East Berlin, from fleeing into, into West Berlin and West Germany. So, so by every measurable standard, we're losing the Cold War in 1980, we're, we're winning it by 1988, 1989, and the only change in that dialectic is the presence of Ronald Reagan for eight years. So when I hear people say, well, he ended the Cold War with Gorbachev's cooperation, it's, it's, it's nonsense. He, he won it and Gorbachev surrendered. Thank you. Um, several times in your book, uh, you talk about the debates about how to run the campaign for the 1980 uh, primary, and one of the key points that you mention is that really, at one point to make it work, they just let Reagan be Reagan. Exactly. Could you talk a little bit more yeah, about that? Yeah, sure. It's just that, is that my old friend, Lynn Nofsinger, is Reigns and my old friend, which by the way, uh, I bet she's the only one here in this room tonight who was in Kansas City in 1976 when Reagan gave that historic speech. She was working on the campaign. She was only seven years old at the time, so I don't know. <laughs> um, is that there was always a debate inside the Reagan campaigns, whether when he's running for governor in 66 or 70 or running for president in 68, is how to handle Reagan, the consultants and the managers and the you know, the media advisors, you know, the, all these people uh, who have grown up, this whole campaign industry uh, uh, has grown up in both parties, is that they, they, you know, as I say, in the future nuclear war, uh, the only things that will survive will be cockroaches and campaign consultants. Uh, um, is that, uh, and they always try to manage Reagan, they tried to package him, they tried to, you know, Governor, you can't say that. This is 1976, this is 1980. And every time it came down to, you know, he knows more about this subject, or he knows more about presenting the subject. Just let Reagan be Reagan. But it was a fight every time, even after he was elected president. And in, the, in, the, uh, in, in 84, this debate with Walter Mondale. He had two debates with Walter Mondale, and Reagan lost a, a, pres a, a political debate. One of the few times he actually lost a debate in his, in his career was the first debate with Walter Mondale. Mondale cleaned his clock because Reagan, the, the 
the consultants had so overprogrammed him and so loaded him with unnecessary facts and figures, he came out and did the debate, and he wasn't, he wasn't Ronald Reagan. He was talking more like Jimmy Carter. You know, during the 80 campaign, uh, there was a saying going around the country, maybe some of you remember it, you know, is that if you ask Jimmy Carter what time it is, he'd tell you how to build a watch. And if you, and if you ask Ronald Reagan what time it is, he'd say, it's time to get this country moving again. Uh, but, but he does this first debate with uh, Mondale, and he's just spewing facts and figures and statistics. And it was because the, the consultants, you know, think that they know better than the guy who's elected president of the United States. And so they fill him with all this nonsense. And, and, he, and, and so he loses the debate to Mondale. And so finally, the second debate, he reverts back to form. It's more, it's, it's not tactical, it's strategic. It's more about his vision for America, his vision for the American people, his vision for the world. And so, so he wins the second debate. But there was always this battle in all of the Reagan campaigns, uh, you know, over how Reagan should be presented and how Reagan should be handled, when the best answer was just like this, is that I showed this speech once to the head of the communications department at the University of Kansas, um, who's, I remember her last name was Carlin, and I can't remember her first name, but she was a lovely lady. Uh, she was the, she'd been married to the uh, Democratic governor of uh, Kansas, uh, John Carlin, I can't remember, but anyway, it's that, I showed her the speech, and she said it was perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect in cadence, perfect in pitch, perfect in delivery, perfect in introduction, conflict, and resolution. It was an utterly, completely perfect speech from the standpoint of, of, of a political leader. Okay, thank you. So two last questions before we sure. open it up to the audience. Oh, my answers aren't too long. Are oh, no, it's great. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> um, one question, actually, this is a student question uh, that was developed for you. Um, it's going back a little bit to thinking about your work as a biographer. Um, so my student wanted me to ask you, um, as a biographer of Reagan, uh, you've spent a lot of years living closely with his history, his legacy. Um, what are some of the challenges that that creates for you as a researcher and a writer? Um, what are some of the things that you do to be able to maintain objectivity? Yeah. One of the difficult things about writing about Ronald Reagan is, is that, you know, you interview a lot of people. When I was working on my book on the 80 campaign, for instance, I interviewed everybody. I interviewed President Carter. Vice President Mondale, Jim Baker, everybody associated with Reagan, Bush, I interviewed Sam Donaldson and Tom Brokaw. And is, is that two things happen. Was that when you're interviewing people about events of 25 years ago, um, the memory gets fuzzy, number A. B is, is that uh, a lot of people embellish what they did 25 years ago. Is, is that, you know, 25 years ago, uh, you know, they may have, uh, you know, been organized, you know, advancing a, you know, a, you know, a car for Reagan, and uh, uh, 25 years later, they're in the back seat of the car with Reagan, advising him on foreign policy. You know, it's just, it, it's that, so the people, especially with somebody who is, is, you know, iconic as Ronald Reagan, they tend to embellish. So you got to constantly guard against people. Um, I remember talking to one guy one time. It was a waste of the interview, but he, uh, he told me about. Um, uh, how he had run the Reagan campaign. I said, I said oh, really? I thought, I thought Ed Meese and, and uh, Dick Allen, he, says, he said, well, I'd let them think they were running the campaign. But really, he said, I said, but I thought you were the Bush campaign. I said, well, yeah, I was. I was really running the Bush campaign. Then I went over to the Reagan campaign. I said, I thought Jim Baker ran the Bush campaign. He said, yeah, well, I really, I let Jim think he was running the campaign. But really, I ran. You know, so so it's, it, you've got to fact check. You've got to make sure that whoever, you know, you've got to interview a lot of people to get the, the story correct, uh, is that that's, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest challenge. Great, thank you. So the last question uh, from me, by popular request, um, what are some things that um, your study of this time period uh, would tell us in terms of the Republican Party today? Um, what's the take uh, that you think Reagan might have on President Trump, for example? Um, Reagan was a party man, uh, and uh, he, um, he supported a lot of Republicans that privately he had doubts about, uh, is that in 78 he campaigned for a lot of Republicans that, that either 
opposed him or said nasty things about him over the years. Uh, uh, but he was, he, was, he, was, he was a party man. But um, I know Mrs. Reagan um, would have had serious, serious uh, doubts about uh, Donald Trump, about his behavior, about his language, about his attitude toward women. Uh, <laughs> I got to say it. <laughs> um, is that because she was very proper and she was very graceful and she was very uh, charming and she was very strict about things and she had enormous influence on him uh, and and what he thought about people and uh, and and how he behaved toward people is that let me tell you the similarities is that Reagan challenged the establishment as I mentioned earlier. Reagan was never accepted by elements of the Republican Party. Trump challenged conventional wisdom and has also never been accepted by elements of the Republican Party. And that's where the similarity is. But that also is where the similarity ends, is that, you know, if you go back and you look at Reagan's speeches, it's, a, it's almost like a tutorial, is that he's quoting Cicero and Franklin and Frederick Douglass and Jefferson and John Kennedy, and he's telling, he's making his case, and he never used, as I said before, he never used, almost rarely used the I, me, or my, uh, is, is that his speeches are filled with facts, intellectual humor, quotes from great statesmen, uh, you know, of, of not only of America, but of the world, Winston Churchill and uh, Sun Tzu and others like that, is, is that, uh, is that, Trump's speeches are, are empty. You know, they, he doesn't quote, uh, th there's no reference to, to give it a framework, to give it a perspective on what it is he's trying to achieve. Uh, is, is that, so I resist very much. You know, Reagan never said, I want to be the next Franklin Roosevelt or I want to be the next Thomas Jefferson. He's far too inner directed. He's far too secure in himself. Is that, so, um, so when Trump says, you know, when he invokes Reagan and compares himself to Reagan, I have to say to myself, you know, that's really not, you know, Reagan was sui generis. Reagan was the Latin, was that mm -hmm. Reagan was singularly unique, is not that there's been, just as Jefferson was, just as Washington was, just as Lincoln was, just as Franklin Roosevelt was, you know, there's not going to be another Franklin Roosevelt. There's not ever going to be another uh, Abraham Lincoln. There'll be an, never be another Ronald Reagan. And people like Trump would give up trying to compare themselves to Reagan. You know, and Reagan would, would have said, in fact, he said it. He said, don't trust me, trust yourself. He said that in the 1980 speech, except in the nomination. And I think he would say to Donald Trump, he says, don't try to compare yourself to me, just be yourself. Great, thank you very much. Sure. Um, we've got time for questions. We've got microphones in both aisles. So if you want to line up, um, we'll kind of alternate between microphones depending on uh, how many people there are in line. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, I recently watched a documentary called 13th, in which the idea that uh, Reagan's war on drugs was really just a subliminal way of breeding racism um, in the United States and kind of opened the door to the mass incarceration era of which we are still experiencing. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of give me your perspective on that, I guess. I'm sorry. What was the name of the documentary? 13th. And it was about how Reagan did what? Oh, no, just the idea uh, was explored that uh, Reagan's war on drugs was really just a subliminal form of racism um, and kind of like breeding the idea that uh, minorities should be just mass incarcerated. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> I haven't seen the documentary, so it's hard for me to comment, but uh, the war on drugs was manifested itself in many ways, including Mrs. Reagan's campaign just say no, which resulted in a marked decrease in drug use in America by encouraging positive response on the part of, uh, on the, uh, part of children. Uh, 
on the issue, I mean, if you want to get into the issue of, of, of race, is that when Reagan was a child, his father would not allow him to see the movie Birth of a Nation because of the racist comment. His father would not allow him to see it. At the same time, Woodrow Wilson was previewing it in, in the White House because it was one of Wilson's favorite movies. And Wilson, as we're now learning, is, is, is a virulent racist. In fact, he signed the executive order creating separate but equal in the federal government. The net from the time of emancipation in 1865 up until Woodrow Wilson's presidency, there was no, there was no uh, law or regulation uh, banning uh, African Americans and whites from using the same bathrooms or the same water fountains. It was Woodrow Wilson who signed the exec executive order starting uh, separate but equal. When Reagan was in Hollywood, he joined a country club and he later found out they had a covenant that would not allow Jewish members. Reagan quit, uh, is that this was the most non-judgmental man on the issue. When he was governor of California, uh, I remember in 1980 or 1976, he pointed to his record. He had appointed more African Americans to senior positions in the California government than any previous, uh, than any, uh, previous governor, including Earl Warren, uh, who later went on to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Reagan, uh, is that in, in, on issue after issue after issue, in behavior from the time he was a child right up until you know, his presidency and, and beyond, is, is that this is a man who just believed in judging people as individuals. In 1978, there was a state senator in California by the name of John Briggs. He introduced, and you, you'll see this, if you've ever seen the movie Milk, this was depicted in the movie Milk, uh, the Briggs Amendment, which was now, you know, here we are 40 years later, and you think, well, this is insane, but it was rational thinking in 1978. Briggs introduced an amendment uh, or, or a, a referendum to be voted on in California to ban uh, gays from teaching in public schools uh, or anybody who advocated a, a gay lifestyle. Is is that Reagan was deeply offended because it offended his sense of privacy, individuality, and people's freedom to come and go as they please and to do, you know, to be, you know, adults to, to behave as they want. And the, the referendum, and Reagan campaigned up and down California against the Briggs Amendment. Now, this was at a time when he's going to get, he's considering running for the 80 nomination. He needs to support a lot of these pro-family groups that are, you know, or groups that were involved in the Briggs Amendment. He needs their support, but he risks losing their support because it's so deep, he was so deeply offended by this referendum. He campaigned up and down California against it, did speeches, did interviews, wrote articles. The ref referendum went down to defeat two to one, crashing defeat. And the day after, Briggs was asked, he said, why did you lose? He said, Ronald Reagan. That was why he lost. This was, this was, this is, when, uh, in, in the introduction, I said Ronald Reagan was a very complex man. He's absolutely right. Ronald Reagan was a very complex man. But at the core of Ronald Reagan was a deep-seated belief in the dignity and privacy of the individual, which was the, the, the intellectualism that was brought, was brought that he learned or he uh, absorbed from uh, from the Enlightenment and then from the American Revolution and then the American tradition of, of privacy. Thank you so much. Sure. Long answer. Do we have any other questions? Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for coming. It has really broadened my mind to hear from an expert in history, being an engineering uh, person. And you mentioned earlier that uh, Reagan had changed his uh, thinking over the years. Yes. And uh, being an engineering person and using the example of physics that you mentioned earlier, that you need a certain force to change. So what were so maybe a three or four major incidences that happened that changed him? Oh, yeah. And in what way? Um, yeah, good question. Um, he. he he, he was, as I mentioned earlier, he was constantly evolving. Uh, Reagan, 
started out in politics as a, as a liberal Democrat. He, was a, he voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times for president. His father got a job from the WPA uh, during the Great Depression. Um, he was uh, in uh, 44, no, in 48, he was head of, um, or, or active participant in Hollywood for Truman. He campaigned for Helen Gahagan Douglas against Richard Nixon when they ran for the Senate in California in, in 1950. Uh, so he was, by, as, as a young adult, he was, he was you know, he used to joke, he says, um, I wasn't a bleeding heart liberal, I was a hemophiliac liberal. Uh, it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but he evolved for several reasons. One was is that when he was in Hollywood, the tax policy at the time was taking up to 95% of his income. Imagine that is that the federal government was taking up to 95% of his income in the form of taxes. So this starts him thinking, uh, starts him on the road to becoming an economic conservative. Of course, it wasn't just him. There was a lot of people who the government was taking 95% of their income. He also saw the influence. He was, of course, president of the Screen Actors Guild in Hollywood in the 1940s and 50s. And he saw uh, the, uh, the attempts by Soviet provocateurs to take over various trade unions in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, um, the, Reagan's life was threatened uh, on several occasions. Um, and at, at one point, he actually started carrying a gun uh, because his life was, uh, life was threatened. Um, is that on the social conservatism, he's kind of nondescript because of his upbringing. But he also had a very cosmopolitan outlook because of Hollywood, uh, and so you, because, because Hollywood, you know, had you know, uh, it, was, it was a liberal institution. Um, but so, but he adopted a lot of those views in Hollywood. But he, I think, you know, getting married, having children, seeing the rest of the world, he became more conservative in some regards. Uh, on the issue of uh, family and things like that. Of course, abortion wasn't an issue in the 1940s. The family wasn't an issue in the 1940s. They were just, they were there. You know, the family was there. Is that, you know, abortion wasn't, you know, not really to row uh, does abortion emerge as a national issue. But he, he evolves over time. It, it's not, you know, the door opens up and all of a sudden he's conservative. From the 1940s up until the 1970s, He's constantly evolving as a conservative. So by 1980, he's a fully formed American conservative who, who, who believes that the central tenet uh, of, of American conservatism is a God-inspired private individual. Yeah, you bet. At the beginning, you said you talked about how if Trump were to say something um, against Reagan, that the party yeah. would turn against him? Oh, oh, sorry. Um, then I guess it's a general question. Do you think that applies to, do you think it also applies to younger voters today? And do you think that his, that, that kind of legacy that he, his previous, or his legacy can impact voters today? And how long do you think that'll last in the future? Forever, forever. It, no, no, it's a good question. It's a very good question because as a Reagan historian, I find myself constantly defending Reagan's legacy and Reagan's history against myth and lies and prevarications. Is that uh, Chris Cuomo this morning sent out a tweet about, about Reagan and guns when he was governor. It's completely untrue. So I had to research it and then send out several, have, I, don't do, <laughs> I don't know how to do tweets, <laughs> but I have somebody on my staff and knows how to do tweets. So, but I just respond to him. So is that, you know, is that nobody worries about the legacy of Millard Fillmore, right? Or, or Rutherford B. Hayes. But the legacy of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt or Winston Churchill or other great men of history is constantly open to scrutiny uh, and sometimes attack. Uh, and this will go on as long as 
people regard, you know, is that there's revisionism going on all the time. Is that Harry Truman has been revised <coughs> upward by history since his presidency. When Harry Truman left the presidency in January of 1953, his approval rating among the American people was 22%. Is that they were glad to be rid of this guy, this failed little haberdasher from Independence, Missouri. But as, as, as people, is, the arc of history is such that People take a, you know, and the ground cools, <coughs> and people take a second, a third, a fourth look at a man in the presidency, and they realize that he was better than they realized at the time that he was president. Eisenhower is going through the same thing. Lyndon Johnson is now going through the same thing. Uh, is that so? Uh, Reagan had the happy step, happy ha happenstance of leaving office as a very popular president, and he remains. Uh, very popular, and as a matter of fact, is actually increasing. There was a new uh, survey of uh, American historians, which had Reagan uh, moving up from 11th to uh, to uh, uh, eighth among all American presidents. So he's one that historians have been successful in, in defending his legacy, uh, but other presidents, Lincoln, uh, Jefferson, uh, Sally Hemings, the slave issue has been downgraded. Uh, George Washington, because he owned slaves, has been downgraded, uh, is that, on the other hand, John Adams, who didn't own slaves, but also happened to be a great man of history, his, th his presidency was one term, was considered to be a failure, especially because of the Sedition Acts. But now historians are looking at Adams and reevaluating him and upgrading his legacy. So it's a constant struggle, and the more important they are, the more prominent they are, the more writings they have, the more they, they constantly go through evaluation and reevaluation, which I guess is probably how it should be. I think that we, we should be constantly poking at history. We shouldn't rewrite history, but we should be constantly examining it. Good question. Speaking of errors, uh, probably the Reagan book that people were more familiar with these days than any other is one called Killing Reagan by Bill O'Reilly. Um, could you elaborate? You want my opinion of Killing Reagan? Yeah. I think that Bill O'Reilly was killing facts when he wrote Killing Reagan. Uh, it is one of the most shameful, untrue, air-filled books that has ever been written by Ronald Reagan. Um, and, you know, is that uh, I, I don't know O'Reilly fancies himself, but O'Reilly is not a historian. Is that, you know, his books contain no footnotes, no, no superscript, no annotations, no index, no nothing. And, and all of his books were all awful. All of his books were all awful. I say that on the record for attribution, all of his books. He wrote for his Killing Lincoln. Killing Lincoln, he wrote that Abraham Lincoln was in the Oval Office in April of 1865. Well, there was no Oval Office in April of 1865. The Oval Office wasn't even built until Teddy Roosevelt was president, you know, 45 years later, uh, 40 years later. Is that, and it was the same thing with the Reagan book. It was just filled with all sorts of just made up things. You know, it starts out that, you know, Reagan was, you know, upstairs, you know, watching soap operas, uh, you know, while Nancy was running the country. It was just, you know, all he had to do was interview Jim Baker or Ed Meese or Mike Deaver, any one of another thousand people who interacted with Ronald Reagan, you know, during the Reagan presidency. And I said, no, I was with the, I was with the president in the Oval Office. I was with the president in the Situation Room. I was with the president on Air Force One. You know, this is that the evidence, the speeches he gave, the meetings he had. Look at his letter to Gorbachev uh, in the last couple months of his administration, how erudite it is, how thoughtful it is, how nuanced it was. And it was a long letter, too. Uh, is that Reagan was fully engaged in his presidency from the first day right up to the last day. Killing Reagan set back the cause of true Reagan history by 10 years. Is, is that all of us, all, not just me, because there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's a number of good Reagan historians, Lou Cannon, Steve Hayward, uh, uh, others, 
who have had to spend waste time battling back against this mess of a, of a book that O'Reilly wrote. You know, it's, it's just, it's a real tragedy. It really is, because, it, because messing with American history uh, is, you know, it's, it's like right out of 1984. You know, he who controls the past, he who controls the present controls the past, he who controls the past controls the future. Is that, is that, I mean, the whole premise of the book 1984 was Winston Smith was destroying and rewriting history. Is that O'Reilly was destroying and rewriting history just to produce a bestseller so he could line his pockets. He didn't care about the Reagan legacy. All he wanted to do was sell a trashy book and make money. It was an utter, complete piece of garbage. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I get a little bit, yeah. Because, you know, the rest of us labor a long time to produce factual history about Franklin Roosevelt. I'm a great admirer about Franklin Roosevelt. I'm proud of my book, December 1941, and how nobly it portrayed Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and I'm proud of my Reagan books, is that, but his book is crap about, about Reagan, stands in direct, uh, is an indictment of, of our true history. All right, we have time for one last question. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. I feel like you're an encyclopedia on Reagan. Um, you mentioned that Reagan won the war. He won the Cold War against uh, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union at that time. So I was wondering, what was Reagan's take on the war? Why didn't he go to war with uh, the USSR at that time? Because, uh, for example, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy had threatened that he would go to war with the USSR, but he didn't. So do you think Reagan would have handled that, uh, that situation differently? You know, th that is such a terrific question. I'll tell you, is, is that Reagan was actually asked during his presidency, it only came out after his presidency, if it came to a nuclear exchange with the Soviets, if it came down to we were loggerheads. We couldn't agree. The Soviets were making military advances. We were making military there's, there's no way out. There's no diplomatic way out. There's no political way out. There's no, there's no way to avoid war. Is that he said he didn't think he could bring himself to push the button first. Is that, which is probably a violation of his oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? Is, is that if you're President of the United States and you accept the terms of your oath, then you have to do what you have to do to defend the country. But Reagan himself said he didn't think, he wasn't sure that he could push the button first. Uh, uh, but, but he found another way. That was what was brilliant about Reagan was who said it wasn't just, we'd been since 1945 with the rise of the Soviet Union and the ashes of World War II and the rise of the Cold War and, and, and the H-bomb, the A-bomb, the space race, and trade relations, and the flashpoints as I mentioned earlier, is, is that there was really only, there were only two options. Either we surrender to the East, uh, and we all, you know, write in Cyrillic and eat borscht for breakfast every morning, uh, or uh, is that we have a, what was then called MAD, mutually assured destruction, is, is that we launch our missiles, they launch our missiles, we wipe out the world, and that was, but Reagan found a third way, which was, was, to, was to grow the economy uh, faster, to, to create the military superiority of the Soviets, to bring them to the negotiating table, to negotiate a favorable uh, uh, terms, but also another element too, was the arming and support for anti-communist guerrillas around the world to act as you know indigenous or, or as proxy fighters for the West, whether it was the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, uh, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, uh, Solidarność in Poland, the Contras in Nicaragua. He was all about aiding these indigenous forces. Reagan was a student of history, and he knew that Caesar and Napoleon had failed as occupiers of, con of conquered countries because of their harshness of, his, of, the, of their policies. So Reagan wasn't going to send U.S. troops into Nicaragua or Afghanistan 
or uh, uh, countries in, uh, in Africa uh, or, or back into Southeast Asia, which proved to be a failure, is because we didn't gain the hearts and minds and, and support of the pop popular support of the, of the Vietnamese people and proved to them the superiority of, of freedom over totalitarianism. But Reagan knew is that indigenous forces could win the hearts and minds of the local population. So he was willing to arm them to speak out and use the bully pulpit to talk about the, the Contras and talk about the Mujahideen and to encourage them and to do that, but let them do their own fighting because they could, win, they could do so and win successfully as long as they had sufficient armament. So that was another element of how Reagan was able to defeat Soviet communism was with ind indigenous forces that, that fought against the uh, Soviet uh, satellite clients, you know, nations. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much for being with us oh, tonight. Oh, sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.